Welcome to Ontario Cold Cases, the podcast, brought to you by Nickel Investigations, the podcast that delves deep into the unsolved mysteries that haunt our province. I'm Jay Nickel, a private investigator with Nickel Investigations, and your host and guide in this journey through the chilling tales that left investigators baffled in communities in search of answers. In each episode, we'll unearth the forgotten stories of Ontario's cold cases, exploring the details, the evidence, and the individuals involved with the eye of a private investigator who specializes in cold case investigations. From the mysterious disappearances to the perplexing murders, our mission is to shine a light in these cases and hopefully bring justice to those who have long awaited closure. But we can't do it alone. Join us as we navigate the twists and turns of these enigmatic cases. We'll speak with experts, law enforcement officials, and sometimes even the families of the victims on the pursuit of truth. So buckle up and prepare to dive headfirst into the world of unresolved mysteries. Together we'll keep the flame of hope burning for justice one episode at a time. Thank you for tuning in to the Ontario Cold Cases, the podcast. Let's begin our quest for answers. Hello, I'm Jay Nickel from Nickel Investigations, and welcome to our next episode of Ontario Cold Cases, a podcast. Season 1, Episode 12, The Murder of Lizzie Tomlinson. I want to warn everyone that some of the details are quite gruesome. On Saturday, May 24th, 1980, polite, shy, six-year-old Lizzie Tomlinson was playing with friends in a park cat known by neighbors, neighborhood kids as Stinky's Park on the southeast corner of Shooter and Sumac Streets in the east of Toronto's downtown region. Approximately 3.30 p.m., a man later described by numerous witnesses as between 25 to 35 years old, about 5'7", 160 to 180 pounds, tanned, blue-eyed with long, dark brown hair, a beard, possibly left-handed and wearing a tan tank top, blue jeans and brown running shoes lured her away from the park. An intensive search was immediately launched, but it wasn't until Monday morning that Lizzie's defiled body was found in a forlorn industrial area, in some bushes near railway tracks at Bayview Avenue, which is now the West Don Roadway, and Front Street, roughly a kilometre from where she was taken. It is believed she and her killer walked the entire distance together. She had been beaten and strangled and was partially covered by weeds and two long boards. The pathologist examiner recorded injuries that included multiple scratches and cuts, a broken jaw, a fist-inflicted injury in her neck, and other bruises on her face and thighs. Horrifically, the killer had shoved the sturdy stalk of a weed up into her vagina, through her stomach and upper body until it came to rest near her right shoulder. She lived for at least an hour, and possibly for a few hours after the insertion of the stalk, but was likely unconscious. Since she had been partially buried, police believe the killer had spent quite a bit of time at the scene. Investigation. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. During the investigation that followed, witnesses came forward with a flurry of sightings. Some kids said they had been approached by a man fitting the suspect's description and offering ice cream in the month prior to the abduction. Some of the children also mentioned having seen the man on the swings near Lizzie and her sister before the kidnapping. Other witnesses saw Lizzie and her killer walking hand in hand east on Shooter Street and south on River Street. A man working outside a factory in Bayview Avenue, only a few hundred feet from the scene of the murder, saw Lizzie and her killer walking south along a footpath that runs between Bayview Avenue and the Don River, but he thought nothing of it at the time and resumed his work. However, another witness, a taxi driver, said he picked up a man and a little girl fitting the descriptions of Lizzie and her killer at Sumac Street and Wascana Avenue, and had driven them to Bayview Avenue and King Street, very close to the murder scene. Now, his statement contradicts those of several other people, so he was quite possibly mistaken. Police at the time said the suspect was spotted by four persons at least. Several days later, Lizzie's body was found in an abandoned industrial site just over a half mile from the park from which she'd been taken. She was covered by two long wooden beams that were hidden beneath some bushes. An autopsy revealed that young Lizzie had numerous bruises, cuts, and scratches on her body. 
her jaw being broken, and there was a heavy bruise in her neck where she'd been punched with what was believed to be a fist. In the end, the autopsy found Lizzie had died from asphyxia by pressure in the front of the neck. Most disgusting of all was a sturdy stalk of a weed being driven into her vagina, through her stomach, and into her right shoulder. Perhaps worst of all was that the physical evidence showed that she had not died immediately, but likely suffered for more than an hour, perhaps more. Police did say some of Lizzie's clothing had been found, but refused to say whether any of the killer's clothes were near the scene. Lizzie was found only wearing a pair of socks and white striped jersey being pulled up over her head. It was determined that Lizzie had been buried or covered after she died, indicating her killer had spent quite a bit of time with her at the murder scene. A cigarette butt was found near Lizzie's body by investigators. It was found to be players light. Brian, Brian Darlam, a senior forensic analyst with the Ontario Provincial Police, testified he could find only a single identifiable fingerprint ridge in the butt and could not make an identification based on such sketchy information. Detectives determined that the killer roamed the Parkhead area for up to four days before he lured Lizzie away. They believe the killer knew the area well. The killer knew he'd be well concealed there and that it must have been well planned. The thicket was a perfect spot for the killer. It was out of sight of cars on the Don Valley Parkway, out of sight of the second floor office in the railway control tower, and out of sight of nearby roads and industrial plants. The brutal nature of the murder sparked fury among residents and the police alike. Anyone resembling the description given of the suspect was questioned, but it would be three weeks be later before someone was charged with the crime. The investigation continues. Hapless beardless men were randomly corralled left and right in the days and weeks after the murder, and the general public was whipped into a fury over reinstating capital punishment. An early psychiatric profile of the murderer said the man is probably quiet, shy, aloof, and a loner. He may have no obvious symptoms of mental illness. A psychiatrist could examine casually and never find any signs of serious abnormality. You could pass him on the street and never notice him. The kind of retiring, unassertive person gets lost in a crowd of three. There are a few clues to his personality. Psychiatrists say he may look like the guy next door, the neighbor who is a bit strange, perhaps a little bizarre, but who keeps to himself, never says much, and never causes any trouble. He's probably unemployed, probably unmarried, and many may consider him a loser. And almost certainly he's come to the attention of some kind of authority, the police, welfare officials, maybe mental health workers. Before now, and have been dismissed as harmless. All psychiatrists did say, most pedophiles, people who are sexually interested in children as young as this, are extremely passive individuals. Take it for what it is. Dr. Stephen Hucker, a forensic psychiatrist at the Clark Institute Toronto at the time, said, They rarely cause any physical harm to the children they molest. In fact, they are often concerned that the child not be hurt. Actual sexual intercourse is usually the last thing such people are interested in. They are more like two kids playing doctor than a criminal and his victim. Rape is extremely unusual, extremely atypical. He continued, it suggests to me two possibilities. One that this was a pedophile who panicked, perhaps because a little girl threatened to tell on him and he killed her in his panic. But the fact that she was raped before she was killed leads me to think it more likely the attack was sexually motivated from the outset and that the murder may have been part of the sexual thrill. Maybe that the killer is not a pedophile at all, in the usually understood sense of that term, but that he was a person who was sexually interested in young children, but more interested in inflicting pain, a nasty, sadistic person. Because he fit the same description, police speculate the perpetrator may have been the same man responsible for the rape of a waitress one year earlier, and just three blocks from the park where Lizzie was taken. The waitress been going home in the Sherburn Street and Dunnass Street East area. She was stabbed 25 times after being raped. The suspect's description was almost a perfect match for what witnesses had given for the man in the park. Still, the case went unsolved and has grown cold in the years since. Suspects. 
This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. Gregory Guerin, 26-year-old Gregory Guerin, Lizzie's cousin, was finally arrested and charged with the young girl's horrible murder. Guerin was a mentally handicapped man who often played with Lizzie and her friends at the park. Lizzie's mother said that Guerin had been with them most of the day that the, the day that Lizzie disappeared, helping get ready for a family barbecue. He even serves a pallbearer at her funeral. The family was certain the police were wrong and that the true killer remained at large. The evidence police had against Garen was only circumstantial. They had found two cigarettes at the crime scene that were the same brand Garen smoked, but the brand was fairly popular among smokers because it was cheap. The shirt that Garen was wearing that day was found to have a bit of Lizzie's blood, but the family pointed out that it could have been from a mere cut or scratch from the rough housing they sometimes engaged in. Garen also did not have a beard. Garen was so distraught about being arrested that he attempted suicide by drinking poison before he could be stopped. He was taken to the emergency room to have his stomach pumped and then placed into custody, where he was held until December when a judge tossed out the case for lack of evidence. In his autobiography, The Case for the Defense, Edward Greenspan, a prominent criminal defense attorney, defended Garen. Greenspan emphasized several facts in the case, some of which included, number one, the handicapped man's unlikely ability to plot a murder, by luring his cousin away from Stinky's Park, something, some, something he wouldn't have to do since Lizzie trusted him. Number two, escape without being seen. Number three, avoid police suspicion. Number four, be easily identified by neighborhood children as the man who led her away from the park. No one else was ever arrested for the murder of Lizzie Tomlinson. Next suspect is a child rapist from 1979. On August 20, 1979, a man raped a nine-year-old girl in a high-rise apartment stairwell. The man was described as being in his early 20s and was seen by two witnesses walking away from a condominium apartment building on York Mills Road just west of Victoria Park Avenue. The rapist lured the girl from the elevator to the stairwell of the 19th floor by asking her to help him find a lost dog. After taking her clothes off, he threatened to kill her. According to police, a man fitting the same description used a similar story in a younger girl in the building in May 1979, but left without touching her. Police were looking for a white man between 23 and 26 years old, about 5 feet 9 inches tall, with a slim build and short brown hair and fair color mustache that extends to the corner of his mouth. The very next night, a man with a similar description was involved in an indecent assault on a 9-year-old girl in a Dawes Road apartment in East York, about 4 miles south. He approached the girl and her brother and told him about a lost dog. The boy went looking one direction while he went to a stairway with the girl and removed her clothes. The suspect was also wanted regarding indecent assaults on three other young girls within the past three months of this incident. Next suspect is Michael Clarence Murray. December 3, 1983, a man was charged with assaulting a seven-year-old girl in an apartment building elevator. Police said the man accompanied the girl in the elevator of an apartment building in Martha Eaton Way in the Jane Street and Lawrence Avenue area where he assaulted her. He then escorted her to a nearby stairwell and assaulted her again. Charged with sexual assault was Michael Clarence Murray of Gerard Street East. Is it possible that Murray was also the same person responsible for the rapes from 1979? The next suspect is a name unknown. Okay, this is an account from someone who believes their father may have been involved. I just know what I've heard back in the 1980s. I heard about the guy that took her from Stinky's. His description fits my dad. He used to live off Sumac, close to Stinky's Park. I lived there from 1979 to 1986. I also went to park school. The actual name of the school was Junior and Senior Park Public School. Park school was off of Shooter, South Regent Park in Toronto. Crosswalk in front of the school brought you to Stinky's store, which is pretty much right beside Stinky's Park. The store and park were separated by a small side street. Anyway, the description fits my dad, even though I've never seen my dad with a beard when I was really young. I was told he had a beard at one point in time. He did grow a beard in the 1990s. He had dark hair and blue eyes. Eventually his hair turned white. He's over 70 now. My dad had long hair. He always wore a baseball cap, always wore a tank top, jeans and sunglasses. He always had a tan during spring and summer. I was also told the man that took Lizzie had blue eyes. My dad is also has blue eyes. He was 31 at that time. He was also quite muscular, just like the description of the man. Uh, just for your information, my father spent numerous years in prison. His last stint was for rape. 
My dad is five foot ten. He was around 180 pounds during that time. He also lived at 14 Blevins Place, which is a quick minute walk from Stinky's. My sister and I both think our father is capable of doing something like this. We've seen my father hold a butcher knife to my mother's throat. When I was four in 1983, he threatened to jump from a 10 store balcony by holding me. My father is also hurt people that did not provoke him. He blacked my eye on Easter Monday, 1994, when I was in grade 9 in Toronto. He did lots of horrible things to my mom, sister, and myself. I'm not saying he did this horrible crime, but he fits the description to a T. He lived a short walk from that park, and he's a horrible person that's done horrible things, and he spent time in prison for rape. End quote. My theory. This episode is brought to you by Nickel Investigations. The case was a huge cause celebre at the time, but after the charge against Cousin were dropped, little else was heard. The real likely possibility is the murderer just simply shaved his beard off and cut his hair. It's also quite possible he's one of the men questioned at the time, that he didn't raise suspicion or was mistakenly cleared. I have not been able to confirm whether DNA evidence does exist for this case. Just months prior to the murder of Lizzie Tomlinson, the Toronto Star had written a three-part article entitled Our Violent Society. Gleaned from the article were information such as this. About 80% of criminal cases in Toronto courts at the time involved people under 25 years of age, and all indications were they were likely getting younger. 50% of the patients lived with only one parent past the age of 16. More than 50% came from broken homes. One third of the patients had a history of violence in their own families. What's more, young people involved in violent crimes find out very easily what's likely to happen on their first offense, and therefore they treat the whole court system as a big joke. In 1979, more than 10,000 Toronto residents were assaulted, double the total from 1969. Case of attempted murder quadrupled over those 10 years. Murder almost doubled and rape increased by 80% over the same period. Part of rape is there's a 90% chance the police won't hear about it, and even the girl's family and closest friends may be kept in the dark about it. In my opinion, the most likely suspect was a teenager or someone in their early 20s, a male that Lizzie knew from the area. She likely be willing to go with the person. In the early 1980s, there were numerous cases of young girls being lured away and murdered. One of those is that of 9-year-old Sharon Keenan, who was last seen on January 23, 1983, Cleaning Jean Sibelius Park, just south of DuPont Street in Brunswick Avenue in Toronto, about 50 minutes northwest of where Lizzie was found. Her body was eventually found stuffed in a refrigerator in her Brunswick Avenue rooming house across the street from the park where she was last seen. Like Lizzie, Sharon had been playing in a park where she was last seen. Both were seen leaving the parks in the company of a man. In each case, after pictures of the missing girls were printed in newspapers, Cab drivers came forward saying they'd given the girls a ride. In each case, a man was traveling with the girl. Dennis Melvin Howe was 43 at the time of Sharon's murder. He was a convicted sex offender. He'd later be accused of the murder of Sharon, but would seemingly disappear. The age of Howe in the photo don't match the description of the murder of Lizzie, but it is possible the description of witness was entirely wrong, or Howe just simply looked a little younger than he did. Did they guess the approximate age wrong? It's possible, too. Certainly Yao, Howe could have cut his hair in the following years and shaved his beard, but where was he in 1980 is also another question. People who knew Howe said at times he was a quiet loner and at others a braggart, but all agreed Howe was a master con artist and adept at changing his look. To this day, no one knows whatever happened to Dennis Melvin Howe and the murder of Lizzie Tomlinson is still unsolved. The Funeral for a Little Girl an overfull crowd of mourners spilled down to Queen Street East for the funeral of Lizzie Tomlinson. Only members of Lizzie's family and their relatives were allowed into the chapel, Washington and Johnston's funeral parlor. Other mourners heard the service over a loudspeaker as they stood in the lobby on the stairs in the second floor corridor. Reverend U. R. Bruce Lee of Kitchener Baptist Church told the gathering, Children have a simple faith, which can be taken advantage of. Maybe it was that kind of faith that led Lizzie to put her hand in a stranger's. Do we give up on faith? 
Thank you for listening to Ontario Cold Cases, the podcast. And please consider subscribing on Patreon, Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. And stay tuned for our next episode coming on Christmas Eve, Sunday, December 24th.